worship this morning is found in Galatians 2 verses 20. It says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. In the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Join us for worship this morning. Kurt Kaiser. Sounds like a race car driver. But no, he's the author of our hymn today. Kurt Kaiser was born in Chicago in 1934, moved to Waco, Texas in 1959, lived there the rest of his life till he passed away just a couple of years ago, November of 18. He's another prolific writer. He wrote over 400 songs during his lifetime, and he didn't even start until he was 35. But he didn't start everything late in life. When he was only seven years old, he knew that he was going to spend the rest of his life dedicated to Jesus. And at that time, he'd already been taking private piano lessons for three years. He started taking these lessons at age four and went all the way through his college career. So it shouldn't really surprise us that he recorded 16 piano solo albums of his own. But he didn't only just work for himself. He arranged songs for many people, produced lots of albums for many artists, like Tennessee Ernie Ford, and Burl Ives, Joni Erickson. And while he was working with them, he also said that he liked especially writing for young people. And I guess that's why he wrote several Christian rock musicals. But while he was doing that, he was also accompanying great artists like George Beverly Shade during the Billy Graham Crusades. So his talents were very, very widespread. And that would be why he was inducted into the Gospel Music Hall of Fame. And his list of awards and accolades is like this long. I wouldn't even begin to tell you all of them. He was like a lot of our other authors. He was always listening, writing down anything he thought might be helpful later on. And one day in 1975, which is where we are, he looked at his notes and this phrase jumped out at him. Oh, how he loves you and me. Now, I don't know how long before that he had written it down. And I don't know how many times he had looked at it before he saw it. But that time, it just jumped at him. And he said the words and the music just tumbled out and he wrote the song in like 10, 15 minutes. Well, he knew it was singable. So he sent it off to Washington, D.C. for a copyright, but it was denied. And it was denied because he didn't have enough original lyrics. And it is a little repetitive. So he thought about that for a while, and then he wrote the second verse. And a lot of people think this is what really makes the song. And it helped. He got his copyright. So we kind of think of this as a children's song, and yet we use it a lot at church. It's one that has worked its way around the world and into the hearts of millions of people, no matter their age. It's a happy song. It's a true song. So let's just enjoy with a smile on our face. Oh, how he loves you and me.
In the 22nd verse of the ninth chapter of the book of Hebrews, we find these words, quote, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. This passage is found in the middle of a long argument where the author of Hebrews is showing how Jesus is the high priest of a new covenant and that the old way of doing things or ways of doing things has passed. That is no longer do sacrifices have to be offered over and over and over at the temple to put off God's wrath against our sin. But rather, Christ has secured our pardon through his death, through the shedding of his blood. That's why it says in verse 12 of the same chapter, quote, He entered once for all into the holy places, not by means of the bloods of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. My brothers and sisters, what joy and honor we have in being slaves of Christ in his kingdom. We have joy because our king is living and is coming soon. We have honor because our king has invited us to come to his table to commune with him. When you take the bread and juice, you take the body and blood that was given for you. The blood that secured our internal redemption, the blood that secured your pardon, the blood that triumphed over the grave. So my friends, let us examine ourselves and see that we are not worthy. See that we need God's grace given to us through the blood of Christ. And let us take communion together with joy and thanksgiving. Amen. Amen. Good morning and welcome to Kimball Christian Church Online. I am excited about the opportunity to be able to speak to you today. As over the last several weeks, we've been going through this book of Acts and it's awesome to see God working and to see his church continue to grow. Uh, throughout the book of Acts, we notice how God uses uh, the apostles in mighty ways, but also through different trials and persecutions, God's church continues on. Uh, today we're going to pick up in Acts chapter 16, where it's Paul's second missionary journey. In Acts chapter 15, Paul was in Jerusalem at the Jerusalem conference, and the church in Jerusalem have given Silas and Paul their blessing to go and report to the churches uh, about what's been going on. And so they begin to head toward north, through past Antioch, and their intention is to go into Asia. 
Uh, before getting there, they stop in a town called Lystra. And it's in Lystra that these two meet or get acquainted with a young aspiring missionary named Timothy. Timothy joins them on this second missionary journey. So after leaving Lystra, they head uh, east and, and begin to head toward Asia. Uh, before long, Luke says that the Holy Spirit forbid them from going any further. So they turn their efforts north and, and begin to head in a different direction. And as they're heading north, they get a little bit further, and God forbids them to go any further north. It says that the Spirit of Jesus stopped them, and so they headed back east. Uh, at this point, the next town they come to is Troas, and it's in, in Troas that we see God working again. Uh, it says that Paul has a dream where God gives him a vision of a Macedonian man who asks him to come to them and provide help. Uh, Paul is really obedient. It's, it, Luke says they immediately got up, and these missionaries sailed to Macedonia. Uh, once this dynamic team has sailed into Macedonia, the first uh, city that they kind of settle into is Philippi. It's in Philippi that, that Paul hears that many go down to the riverside to pray, and so he decides to go down there and to see um, who is there that day. Uh, as, Jesus, or as Paul goes down to the riverside, he begins to share with them about who Jesus is. And, and many of them are, are Jews and, and some Greeks. And, and Paul is sharing this gospel message. And it says, Luke puts it this way, that Lydia, who is there listening, um, is so drawn to Paul's message. It says that the Lord opened her heart to pay attention. Uh, she hears the words of Paul. She believes in Jesus. And she and her household are baptized after which she compels the missionaries to stay with her for a while. And so they uh, do so. They stay in Philippi, and as they're staying with Lydia, they're going out, and they're preaching the gospel message around the town, the city of Philippi. It's not long before Paul runs into a little bit of trouble with a demon-possessed girl who, the Bible says, annoys him, and he casts the demon out of the girl the slave owners who own that girl realized that their opportunity to make money off of this demon-possessed girl had just gone away. And they begin to make plans to re have revenge on Paul for meddling in their business. Needless to say, this entire interaction leads to the arrest of Paul and Silas. They're arrested, beaten, and thrown into maximum security prison. But it's in this that God shows that he's bigger. He's bigger than the shackles that are on their feet. He's bigger than the bars that are in front of them. And he's bigger than the guards that are standing watch over Paul. As Paul remembers the words of Jesus and Silas and Paul are praying together, they begin to worship. And the Bible says that God shook the foundations of the jail cell. This earthquake shakes not only the doors from its hinges, but the shackles from their feet. The uh, Philippian jailer is so moved by God's power. And the faithfulness of Paul to remain where he was, not to run and escape from jail, but to remain where he was. The Philippian jailer was so taken by Paul's faithfulness to stay there and God's power that he had shown through this, that he asked the Paul this question, how can I be saved? It's not too far after this that Paul would and those missionaries would uh, leave Philippi and um, head over to Thessalonica, where Paul went into the synagogue, as he commonly did when he entered town. He would go into the synagogues and he would begin to reason with the Jews, trying to convince them, trying to show them that Jesus is the Christ that the Old Testaments were pointing to. He's the Messiah that's always been written about, that was prophesied about. It says that for three weeks, Paul returned to the same synagogue and he would reason with the Jews. Some of them began to believe in Jesus, while others were not so excited about Paul's preaching. These jealous Jews began a riot in Thessalonica and they began stirring things up. So Paul and the other missionaries headed out of town and went down the road to Berea. Berea wasn't too far away, but but as Paul went into the synagogue to once again reason with the Jews that were there, he was met with a different 
type of attitude. It says the Bereans were noble. Their attitude was that they wanted to hear the gospel truth that Paul had to share with them, and they wanted to research with eagerness if Paul, what Paul was saying matched up with what Scripture had said. Now, Paul was able to, to preach to them and teach them, but it wasn't long. Remember those jealous Jews in Thessalonica? Well, they found out where Paul was, and they headed down to Berea. It was before those Jews got to Berea that Paul was able to escape and go to Athens. And while he had left for Athens, he left Silas and Timothy in Macedonia to continue in their efforts to encourage and to strengthen the church, these new believers to encourage their faith. Paul will later write in the, the letter to the church at Thessalonica. He says, When we sent Timothy, our brother, and God's co-worker in the gospel of Christ, to establish and exit exhort your faith no one uh, that no one be moved from these afflictions see you yourselves know that you, we were destined for this but when we were with you we were telling you beforehand that suffering and affliction would come and sure enough it came to pass and for this reason i can no longer bear but i want to know so i sent to learn about your faith i feared that some had tempted you that the tempter had tempted you, and that our labor would be in vain. He would find out that the Thess church in Thessalonica continued. When Paul reaches Athens, he's had given this incredible opportunity to not only go into the synagogue and, and to reason with the Jews that were there, but, but also to preach in the, the marketplace. It's there in those public marketplaces that others heard the teachings of, of Paul. They wanted to know more, and so he was actually invited to this place called Mars Hill. It's this incredible place where the university professors would get together, and they would talk about uh, the newest theologies, and, and um, they would uh, reason about the newest, latest theories. Uh, they would talk about what philosophies were the greatest. Uh, see, in Paul's day, those who were on Mars Hill talking and reasoning were some of the greatest thinkers throughout all the world. Paul gets this awesome opportunity to, to step right up and to share the gospel message with those in Athens. Um, and so he steps up, he recognizes his audience, and he presents the gospel message. Not in the same way that he spoke to the Jews and tried to reason with them with the scripture, but rather... Paul sees his audience and adjusts how he presents his message. He convinces them that God really was greater than their pantheistic, man-made, idol-worshiping gods. It says that some of those decided to start believing in, in Jesus and the gospel message that Paul presented. One of la Paul's last stops before returning to Antioch is the city of Corinth. It is here that Paul would receive yet another vision from God. God continues to, to lead and to direct Paul. Uh, so Paul remains in Corinth because God says, this is a place that you can encourage and build up the church. For a year and a half, Paul uh, strengthens the church. Silas and Timothy will later meet up with Paul there in Corinth, and, and it says that many believed in Jesus. They were baptized, and the church grew. Eventually, Paul would return to Antioch, and he begins to make his rounds to those churches. His second missionary journey is kind of drawing to an end, but his ministry is not. He's hopping from church to church to encourage the people about the places that he's been and the work that God has been doing, to report about the churches that have been born uh, he's reporting about his journeys. Essentially, Paul is keeping this network of churches tied together and praying for one another. He recognized that we are one church in many places. Something that we can continue to remember is that we are one church in many places. Paul is not only teaching about, um, uh, but God is also using Paul. He's using his testimony in really mighty and powerful ways. 
He's allowing Paul to perform miracles and cast out evil spirits to to give him um, kind of this credentials that he really is speaking the truth. In mighty ways, God is showing up and he continues uh, to be seen through Paul's ministry. Acts chapter 19, verse 20 says, So the word of the Lord continued to increase and prevail mightily. Throughout Paul's missionary journey, this second one in particular, there's so many things that we can learn. There's so many stops around the road that we could stop and dive into and see how Paul reacted to those around him. Now we can see that, that God can bring about good results, even from disagreements. It doesn't have to be decisive. We can see the power behind listening to the Holy Spirit and discerning God's leading that he's giving to us. Uh, we can remember Paul as he sits in the, in the jail cell and how important it is to, con, to, to continue to turn to God in prayer, to worship him through any situation that we're put in. Uh, we should be encouraged when we read about the, the Jews in Berea who, who sought after truth with eagerness, and, and likewise, we should do the same. Uh, we can realize that, that the gospel message will always stay the same. But just as Paul enters Athens and, and changes his approach when talking with them, we also need to change our approach. The gospel message will never change. But our approach on how we share that always needs to change. All of these are good lessons. And we can stop and talk about all of them. But most of all today, I want to focus on what Timothy does for the churches. As Paul says that he stayed behind to exhort and to build up their faith. I want to take the time to talk about what it is to build up and encourage your faith this morning. I want to talk about our faith that saves. See, our faith is one of the foundational differences between many churches today. And their understanding and explanation of faith and their individual beliefs about faith as a condition of salvation, the Catholics, the Protestants, the Christians, we all have unique explanations of what it is. When one begins to study the Bible for understanding, you'll begin to see that faith, it really is a condition for salvation because or based on the belief of Jesus. While you'll see in some verses that emphasize a belief in Jesus and, and other places, you'll find that there's work that is involved in your faith. And in some verses, it appears that that work is completely excluded from your faith. Um, some, so what does the Bible mean when we are justified by faith? When it says that whoever believes in me shall have eternal life. Well, let me start with this proposition this morning. Our faith that saves is actually built on four consistent parts, and that is knowledge, assent, trust, and obedience. See, the biblical scholar has a difficult time helping us to even define faith. Even as they continue to uh, study the, the biblical historical texts that we have available, while in English we have this understanding that Belief is different than faith. Now, belief is the assent. Uh, it's the act of the mind, a, a judgment that we make of the intellectual of a particular idea or um, statement to believe that it's true. And thus, we might have knowledge gained through the reading of Scripture or because someone else told us through the preaching, through the teaching or conversations. But knowledge is not necessarily belief. Belief um, is not necessary in order to have knowledge. See, knowing ideas doesn't rely on us actually believing those ideas. We also use the word faith to carry belief further in our understanding. Faith is not only the knowledge that we have about something. It is concluding that the knowledge that we do have is true then placing our trust in that knowledge and placing and it produces an obedience because of our faith. See, unfortunately, as the biblical scholars are looking at the Hebrew text, the Greek, and the Latin, even the Latin translations, 
the concepts can get somewhat lost as there aren't many words to help us describe these differences between what a faith is and what a belief is and believing on or believing in. All of these have similar words when it comes to the Greek texts. And even those in the Latin texts don't give us very many clues. Therefore, one must study the context of words in order to gain a better understanding of their meanings. These homonyms are not unfamiliar to us in our own English language. If you will, for instance, it would be hard for you to understand what I was talking about if all I said was look at the bat. Uh, it, without context, you wouldn't know whether we were talking about playing a game of baseball or if we, I was asking you to look overhead at a flying bat. My wife does the same thing to me often. As she'll break into the middle of a conversation and without any other context, I am left completely lost. I think that the rest of her conversation and is still in her thoughts, but I can either see them or hear them. And so it is, as we consider these things, that scholars have to look at the context in order to build an understanding of what faith is. Uh, some of those that have done that take, for instance, uh, Thayer's Greek Lexington uh, of the New, New Testament. It defines faith in this way. It says, a conviction full of joy and trust that Jesus is the Messiah, a divinely appointed author of eternal salvation in the kingdom of God, conjoined with obedience. James Whitten writes in Greek-English lexicon, that faith is to believe, to trust in, to put faith in, to confide in, to rely on a person or a thing, to believe, comply, or obey. And a third resource, the Kittle's Theological Dictionary, says that faith is as to believe, is as to obey, is as to trust, as to hope, is as to faithfulness. See, each of these lexicons reflects the idea that, that faith saves is a consistent with four constructs that we previously mentioned. That is, faith that saves has to exist with knowledge, assent, trust, and obedience. This has always kind of been a struggle. The early church struggled with this idea that faith would consist of all four areas consistently. Uh, for instance, a group called the Gnostics were more concerned about the knowledge they had. And because of such, the other constructs began to fall from importance. Whereas the Stoic morality relied more on self-reliance. And so as they looked at faith, they began to see a decline in the trust as it pertained to their faith. When Neoplatonism began to infiltrate theology, the mysticism of God uh, brought down the knowledge of him. By the time of Thomas Aquinas, Rome had its own definition of assent. For the Roman Catholic Church, assent was the only part of faith that really mattered, what to believe in. But it was not for the individual to determine what to believe in. For Rome, rather, it was decided for them. What Rome told you to believe in is where you should place your faith. Uh, to this day, Rome continues to redefine an individual's faith and what it should be placed in. As the, former, uh, as the reformers who decided to resist Rome's leadership, Luther insisted that being assent to Rome, instead of being assent to Rome, that we ought to be assent to the Bible. Luther asserted that we had to have a knowledge and understanding of the Bible, that we would believe in what the Bible said rather than in what those who are in charge in Rome told us to believe. He wasn't wrong. But in his efforts to correct this culture, Luther also manipulated Scripture. For instance, in Romans 3.28, the Scripture says, For we hold that one is justified by faith apart from works of law. It is in this scripture that, that Luther would insert the word only, for we hold that one is justified by faith only, apart from works of the law. 
His addition to Scripture is dangerous at best, and that move to make a point, uh, and that move to make a point is dangerous. See, all of this is to help us to understand that our faith is not it's not an emphasis of any of the one construct or any one part, but rather we have to have a consistency of all parts. As a side note, we also read through scriptures and we read about the faith, the, the reference to the whole body of doctrine, the summation of what we believe. And Jesus would talk about a miraculous faith, those who would perform miracles and move mountains. And yet as we move forward in our conversation today, we're talking about our faith as a condition to our salvation. And that faith has to be consistent in knowledge, assent, trust, and obedience. Take, for instance, Romans chapter 10, verse 17 says, Faith comes from hearing and hearing the word of Christ. The knowledge of Jesus Christ is it's essential to our faith. And yet to know Jesus is not salvation. As we've seen in the demon-possessed girl earlier with Paul's journey, the demons know who Jesus is, they know the power of God, and yet this knowledge does not bring them salvation. Likewise, many who have heard the name of Jesus and the work that he did at the cross to atone for their sins, but this knowledge that they have still does not provide salvation. As we continue to read through the book of Acts and to see the church grow, we see people move from their knowledge about Jesus to a belief in Jesus. Remember Lydia? She was already in a place of prayer. She knew God, but she did not believe in Jesus and the work that he had done. Paul preaches to her a gospel and shows her who Jesus is. And when she believes in him, she's baptized along with the rest of her household. Paul commonly went into synagogues because the Jews believed in who God is. They had knowledge of him and the scriptures in front of them. Paul, he reasoned with the Jews in order to show them who Jesus is, that they might also believe in him. First Timothy says that this is a trustworthy saying and it deserves full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom Paul admits he is the worst. But I received mercy, that in me, as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example to those who believe in him for eternal life. See, our confession that Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior, it's the statement we make of trust. We're placing our confidence in the person and the work of Jesus at the cross. And through his blood that was shed, we trust in him for our salvation. John points out that there are many who saw the miracles of Jesus. They heard his teaching. In fact, John even says they believed in Jesus. And yet, they did not put their trust in him or to confess him as Lord and Savior. Because they love the glory of man more than the glory of God. John chapter 12, verse 42 and 43 sums it up this way. Nevertheless, many, even those who were in authority, believed in him. They believed in Jesus. But for fear of the Pharisees, they did not confess it. And so that they would not be put out of the same synagogue. For they loved the glory that comes from man more than the glory that comes from God. See, at this point, I want to be clear. Our faith in Jesus is based on a gospel truth. Jesus is the Son of God who came to earth. He lived a sinless life, and then he went to the cross and atoned for our sins. He rose again, and now he sits at the right hand of the Father. It is through this perfect sacrifice that you and I have been offered forgiveness of our sins. 
We can't make that atonement for ourselves. But rather, through Jesus' act on the cross, we are offered this gift of eternal life. It's not the works that have saved us. We haven't done anything. Rather, it's through the faith in Jesus Christ that we are saved. And yet, without our acceptance of this truth, through faith and the obedience to God's word, we are not saved. As James would put it, some will say that you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works, and I will show you my faith by the works I do. I believe, you believe that God is one, and that's good. But even the demons believe that, and they shudder. For as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so also your faith apart from works is dead. I am far less concerned about the details of our theology and so much more concerned about where your faith is at and what it means for our discipleship. See, I think as we look through the stories of Paul as he's on his missionary journeys and we see all of these different conversions, the thing that that impresses me the most or, or gets me the most excited is to watch as Paul came alongside of people to disciple them. He recognized where their faith was at and then he helps them to continue in their faith, to grow in it so that they might believe in Jesus, get baptized, and to continue the church. Now, Jesus calls us all to be disciples, to come aside one and another, and to share that gospel message, to recognize in others where their faith was at or is at, and to help them to, to encourage them to grow in their faith. So I ask you, where is your faith? Are you, are you struggling with even knowing who God is and who Jesus is? Are you stuck on believing that Jesus really is the Son of God? who died for your sins. Or maybe we just haven't gotten to the point where we trust that completely to allow Jesus to be the Lord and the Savior of your life. And maybe, maybe you believe all of that and you've said, yes, I've, I've done that and I've, I've told Jesus that I love him and I've, I've prayed and I've, I, I've uh, trusted in Jesus, but I've never followed through in baptism. Where is your faith? Are you growing? Are you going and making disciples? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for being able to see uh, Paul in his journeys and how he preaches and, and comes alongside of others. Father, I pray for the Christian that you give them opportunity to share your gospel message with those around them. And Father, just like Paul, that they would be bold in their, in their message of the gospel that they would share it with others uh, almost in a reckless love kind of way. God, I pray for those who are not, not Christians, who have not accepted uh, this gift that you have to offer us. May you be working on their hearts that they might come to know you and that their faith might, might also save them as they place their trust in Jesus. Lord, we thank you for this time together. It's in your son's name I pray.